every nation has got that power. They deserve to be One, one more, Ron. <laughs> All right, it's about time. Good morning. morning. Went from very nice and pleasant, sweet, soft mornings to, ugh, where'd all of that humidity come from? Oh, well. I'm from where they say it's a dry heat. <laughs> Not that wet stuff. Anyway, 
Would you bow with me, please? Our loving God and Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for this Lord's day. Father, we thank you for the beauty of your creation. Father, for the constant change and weather and seasons. and They remind us of how powerful you truly are. Father, we come to you this morning as we enter into your Bible study. We pray that um, you would be with us as we look into your word. Father, help us to better understand the things that you've left for us. Father, that we will apply them to our lives. All these things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> this is where we left off last week. And uh, I was I was kind of hung up a little bit. I got um, Steve uh, prodded me with a, a question on on the term morphe, the form or shape, um, how it doesn't change. And I thought, what did I miss? And so I, I went back and I looked at it. And, and I'm sure that in the vocabulary and the uh, all of the grammar that goes along with interpreting Greek, there's probably a, a really great explanation. But what I wanted to look at is that Morphe is used in chapter in, in the, let's see, what verse were we in? Um, this was verse six. And it's talking about the outward appearance of, of Jesus or God, how it doesn't change, how the nature of God has not changed since creation. And then, uh, so before coming to earth, in this verse, it says that God or that Jesus was equal to God and he had all, had and has all God's qualities. Um, so consider, okay, I need to look and see here. I, I've looked at this, I've looked at it, so I can come back and figure out where I was at. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep going and then we'll talk about it some more. So the word that was used to describe his unchanging nature was morphe. His shape, his outward appearance, uh, and this is in the Godhead, the nature of, of uh, the Godhead, uh, Jesus and God collectively. Then uh, in John chapter 17, verse 5, it says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus gave up all that glory and honor that was his to be had in heaven to come to this earth. And that is the point of these verses that we're reading here in uh, First Corinthians, I mean, not First Corinthians, uh, Philippians chapter 2, 1, 2, verse 6. Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. So verse 6, we're talking about the nature of God, the form of God, and how it didn't change. <clears throat> He didn't think that was something to be held on to. Uh, he didn't look at it as a spoil, is kind of the term that is used here. Uh, an object of great desire, a prize. Uh, Jesus had no desire to hold on to or tightly grasp those things of heaven. Then verse 7, but instead of holding on to all of those earthly or those heavenly honors, he made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself. Of what? Dan? Um, well, not, not the part that, uh, where it says in, in well, all the fullness of deity. So the other part. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of speculation, but there's also all kinds of scripture. And one thing I wanted to point out is that the form used here in verse 7 is also morphe, if I had that correct. And, but it's speaking of the man. So it's a contrast between how as 
as deity, he did not change, that nature didn't change. But as a man, it, there's going to be two illustrations for Jesus here. There's two words used. One is speaking of his, once he hit, once he was on earth, did he ever, was he ever anything other than a servant? No. So in that sense, he did not change. There's another word used, um, and we'll see it in verse 8, uh, Shema, I believe, where it, it says that uh, he changed. But that was because he was, and it says he was likeness of a man. He was born as a child. He changed into a teen. He changed into an adult. That way he changed. Kelly? I was going to say, uh, a humbling, he humbled himself to come here and he took on the form of a servant all of his life. He served other people to, in order to bring them bond the connection back to God and to bridge that gap and bring salvation. But he gave up everything in heaven and took on the form of a servant. He humbled himself. Okay. Daryl. Okay. Two quick things. One is, if you notice whether it's emptied himself or made himself of no reputation, it is something that he did to himself. It was it was done by him. It wasn't something that was done to him, which I think is sometimes something people miss. The other thing is, he changed position, but not power. Okay. Uh, this is something that he did himself wasn't done to him, and it was a change in, how did you say that last position, part? Position, not power. He changed position, but not okay, power. Okay, he changed position, but not power. Uh, Ron? Yeah, related to that change of position, that's what I was going to say, is that in addition to, he humbled himself, and a part of that humility, though, is he learned obedience. And so he did give that up, because he was not obedient to any, he was God, God. He was still God, but yes. he learned obedience, just like we see in the garden. Okay. Very good. Other comments? Okay. <clears throat> um, in John 1.1, 1, 1, we see where it says that um, it, where God became flesh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. Um, <clears throat> and before I go far off the track... I usually quote that, but I don't want to do it right now. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word, and see, He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was nothing made that was made. And then in verse 14 it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that is the whole emphasis of this set of passages in first in Philippians chapter two is that he has made a choice and he has given up those things heavenly for those things earthly in order that he might serve a purpose. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about that as well. In John in Matthew chapter one, verse twenty-three, it says that Jesus was called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. It goes to the point that's been made that he, he changed position but not power. Uh, in John chapter 20, verse 28, Thomas called Jesus looking at him physically, Lord, my Lord and my God. So he was recognizable once those around him began to know what to look for. But he made himself of no reputation, emptying himself, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Scripture doesn't say what attributes he actually gave up, as Dan pointed out. It, he instead took on something. He took on humanity. He took on the human form and understood it. Uh, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And the suggestion here is that he was uh, born of a woman, took on the likeness of a man. And, and that's uh, where we come back to 
the word form again. <clears throat> this is the same word as in verse six, uh, morphe. And Steve, we were talking about this. Uh, we brought this up last week. The form, the shape, the outward appearance, the nature of Jesus didn't change from a spiritual point of view. Verse 8 is going to talk about the man, how he does change. Um, Jesus' nature didn't change when he came to the earth. He was a bond servant. Dulao is the word, uh, a male slave. Jesus took on all the qualities of a slave, totally dependent on and obedient to God. As a man, he still was dependent on God. And he was a slave to the needs of mankind, especially as it related to salvation. What did he say about salvation? Fern? Well, I like 2 Corinthians verse 9. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Okay, very good. Um, 2 Corinthians 2, 9? 8. 8, 9. 8, verse 9. <clears throat> Any other comments before we move on? Okay. Jesus is noted as a servant in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, Mark 10, verse 45, Luke 22, 27, and John 13, 5 is the example we have. I think I put those in. Yeah, I inserted those. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. And whosoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This, the message is repetitive. It's, it's not a... Uh, it's not a boring message. It's a reiterated message. Um, for who is greater? Luke 22, 27. He who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. And this was in the context of the Lord's Supper. Um, John 13, 5. After that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. He was acting as a slave, as a common slave. And that was not something that the Jews were ready to accept or any other person, especially in the Roman Empire. Jesus never changed in his role as a servant while he was on the earth. So there's, a, yes, Dan. And he continues to serve as our high priest in heaven, uh, and he uh, is always ready to serve and help us in our prayers in times of need. And after all, who is he portrayed there as always portrayed the Father uh, who loved us first, who provided for our needs first, which we all learn from, from a heavenly Father. Jesus personified it and he came down and demonstrated it in human form. Okay, very good. Other thoughts before we go along? <clears throat> All right, and Fern, thank you. We, hey, you're reading my notes now. Kelly does it and Ron does it and now you're doing it. Um, Jesus went from equal to, with God, the highest position imaginable to the lowest position imaginable, a slave. First Corinthians 8, 9, which Fern just read for us. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, for my sake, he became poor, that through your poverty, or through his poverty, you might be rich. It's pretty amazing. I mean, these there's a lot of stuff crammed in these, these eight or ten verses right here in the first part of... Uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2. Note that Jesus was not like man. And I think, who, who said that? Somebody, somebody, I think Kelly maybe made the illusion. Some people like to say, well, Jesus was like a man. Was he like a man? 
He was a man, wasn't he? I mean, in all things, he was a man. He was born of a woman and he was raised. We see him at different age points in his life. Uh, he is a man. He is a human being. John chapter 1, verse 14, we read that earlier, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, by this you know that the Spirit of God, that I may stop and read from all the words. By this you know the Spirit of God, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Can I see a hand? Okay. Yeah. No scratch or it's so. <clears throat> yes. Just when, I, when I look at this, I look at the time of the crucifixion and how many people want to little or less than the, what Jesus went through on the cross in his time before. You know, I've, I've heard people say, you know, because of who he is, it, it did not affect, you know, he was not feeling it like a man. You know, he, he did not go through it. And so when I look at this scripture, I look at what he went through on the cross, that he went through everything we would have faced as a man. I mean, as far as feeling, beatings, uh, taunting, everything he went through, it, 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 hits, it hits home even more. I don't, I don't think it would have hit as hard if there was some supernatural power that allowed him to not feel the pain or deal with pain and discomfort as though we would. So I always, I always go back to the crucifixion uh, when I see flesh. And, and if it was uh, not affecting him physically, then why the need for Simon of Cyrene? He was physically unable. He was at that point worn out. Um, other thoughts? John? It's a very old question that we consider not only the physical sufferings of Jesus, but also the spiritual. When he was tempted in the wilderness, he was at all points tested as we are. So the question has always been posed, could Jesus have sinned? He's, he's a man. And he was tempted like we are, but he's also God. On the one hand, he could not sin. It would break a promise of God. He couldn't raise up another Savior. I've always thought there's one answer to this age-old question. He did not sin. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other is kind of a fool's question. Could he or could he not? Yeah. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't. Uh, it, it's uh, speculation on our part to go the other way, isn't it? Other thoughts, comments? So, um, again, his humanity is noted in Scripture. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, it says, Therefore, in all things, uh, he had, had to be made like his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful, uh, might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Like, uh, it, in this case, is the same as likeness in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, which is right behind us. Uh, Strong's is, I'm, I'm going to come to you, Marianne. I'm not, I'm not ignoring you. Um, Strong's only a little bit. Strong's Greek, homeo, 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 yeah, homeo, anyway, that word, is to make like or to liken or assimilate he had the likeness of men and that's where i was coming from earlier is that he he was born a man he was born as a little baby and grew through stages and so in that thing in that respect he is in the likeness of man but he is a man marianne well <clears throat> i know john already called me a fool but i believe that he could have sinned and that was that is the secret of jesus is that he became everything and he, he was able to sin, but he made a promise to God. And so therefore, he didn't sin because of his commitment to God. We make the same commitment when we become Christians, and yet we fall, and we shouldn't fall. We, we don't need to sin. We could be like Jesus and not sin. 
if we really put it to our mind that we were not going to sin. I Paul didn't make it. Um, and that is very difficult for us to make it too, but it was hard for Jesus. To. It was hard. But you know, he saw heaven before he came down. He knew where he was going. He knew. He didn't have any doubts. He knew who his father was. He had no doubts. And our doubts come in, and then we put ourselves first. I don't know. That's the only way I can explain it. But I do believe he could have sinned as a human. He could have. And that's why he was tempted. Otherwise, why would they tempt him if it wasn't possible for the Satan to get rid of him right there and then? Okay. Okay, so I'm sorry, John. But, yeah. Well, I'm sorry I'm a fool living in his conversation. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm sorry. I'll be quiet. Okay. Um, so the, the emphasis here is really on the similarity of, of Jesus to man. It's not about the differences. It's not about how was he different than us. It's about how he was similar to us. Uh, Romans 8 verse 3 says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. It was necessary for Jesus to go through all the things that we go through in order to condemn sin. Had he have not, we could say, well, he was a perfect guy. He's not going to sin. Couldn't we? I mean, that opens the door to some place. Let's don't go there. Um, <clears throat> uh, chap, uh, 2 verse 7 again. Yes, Kelly. I'm just going to say that Jesus taught us in everything, and that includes when he was tempted. We know that when he was tempted, he, he refuted that temptation with Scripture. He's teaching us to stand on the Word of God and remain strong. And so when people, not only when Satan came along to tempt him, when he was condemned by the Pharisees because he, he's talking to a prostitute, he taught us how to handle these that he it's the sick that need the doctor. And so he taught us all these aspects in all of his life, including how to refute temptation. Okay. Stand on the word of God and, and you will be strong. Okay. Dan? With Job, the devil went and asked permission to tempt. To, so that he could bring him down and make Job encourage Job to curse God. Right. Um, the devil probably came to Jesus for the same reason to destroy God's plan. And Jesus uh, in the garden was tempted to the point of drops of blood, sweat drops of blood falling from him. And he it was his temptation was as excruciating as anything, any temptation we've ever gone through. And him going through that is what makes him so wonderful to us and such a great inspiration for us. That he truly did know what it's like to be human and to bear those temptations. Okay. Very good. Um, so, again, the emphasis is on Jesus' similarity to man, not on the differences. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Therefore, in all things, and that's what you all have been discussing right here, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be merciful, faithful, high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. And then again in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. Sympathize versus sympathize. He's been there. But was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. More importantly, he was willing to die for us. And this is in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. Paul says, speaking to the Corinthians, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. And John chapter 3, verse 16, By this we know love, because he had it taken away from him. Somebody stole it, somebody murdered him. No, Jesus, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So the contrast between Jesus as an equal to God and a servant, um, being a, a man being a servant is what? Pick, pick some word. The contrast between God and man and, and what, how Jesus' transition went. It's amazing. It is inspiring. It is vivid. It, it's it's a whole, pick out another word, Ron. In, in addition to to the high priest, mediator, advocate, Jesus <clears throat> is a wonderful advocate for us. Why? One of the reasons he was tempted like a man. He felt like a man. All the emotions temptations as well as the emotions he wept he felt happiness he knows us what a wonderful advocate we have between us and the father mm -hmm. thank you other thoughts yes ben i was just curious do you think it was ne uh, it was necessary for jesus to come and act as a bond servant because the world has never seen a true bond servant up until that point They've only seen a, a regular servant who would be diagnosed with the, with the louse. Uh, that the world has never seen a true bond servant up to that point. Do you think maybe that's why it was necessary, also, obviously, for the vacation of our sins, but for him to come to give people a real example of what a bond servant is supposed to be? Luke chapter 22, verse 27. For who is greater? He who sits at the table? the Lord, the Master, whoever, or he that serves. Is not he who sits at the table the greater person is the answer? That that Lord is, is the greater person, supposedly, right? And yet Jesus says, and I think, I think this might be the, to me, this is the answer to your question. Yet I am among you as one who serves. He re refers to himself as that servant, that slave. And if he says, if I am the master and work as a slave, how much more so should you be? What a great example. That's, I mean, that shows the disparity of leaving God and becoming a man. And not only a man, but the lowliest of men, a slave. So there's a lot of uh, churches I've read about. Some I've been to where they do these ministry uh, reviews to see what your personal ministry is. And uh, there's some biblical point to that. Uh, but one thing that we can all do is serve. That is the ministry, to serve and to find the need and, and fill it. And one of the things that I do is, because uh, I know how important the head of the table is, is that if I'm visiting someplace, I'll, I'll make sure I don't sit at the head of the table. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Other other thoughts or comments? Yes, John. Back to Hebrews four fifteen. Well, the confusion seems to have arisen from King James using the the term like or a likeness. Uh, revised versions, the New American Standard and the English Standard, uh, have revised that to make it not a likeness, not a similarity, but a just as or in the same manner as. Mm -hmm. It's not just. Sort of, kind of like a man, but exactly as a man. Exactly as a man. Uh, and that, the commentary, I wish I could put everything in that I run across in a, in a commentary because, we, well, I'm glad we don't. I'd be here until 
2045. Um, John has hit it on a, hit the nail on the head is, is that sometimes in translating you lose the the real meaning of what it is, and some some versions correctly say that instead of being like or a likeness, uh, it is the exact form of. It is, it is uh, you know, it's different because he's not just sort of like, he's not like he drew a picture and said, well, that kind of looks like a man. He's actually the guy that, that wears the pants and puts a shirt on. I think back to the context of Philippians 2, this is to inspire us to be humble. Seeing if we're wrestling and we're grappling with this idea of God becoming flesh, of God submitting himself to all the regulations that man is submitted to, to be tempted as a man, to, to struggle, to, to hurt, and to do all these things as a man. He left and did this by choice. The slight adjustment of us in just accepting our place as a servant should be tiny when we look at it in view of this. And that's what Paul was trying to get the church to Philippi and Philippi to, to succumb to. Yeah. Pick, pick, pick a word, right? How, how, how big of a disparity is this, Dan? This is not just a, an academic thing being done here, talked about, and trying to grasp in the best humanly possible to understand the, the nature of our Savior. This is very important. There are many people who are being led astray because they are being taught a different Jesus. This is so important to talk about this. Because there are many people who are being taught a different Jesus. And so it's the Galatians 1 verse 5. If they and, teach and something first, other, let them be anathema, right? And 1 John 4, right? other places. Okay. Other comments here? All right. It is important. So, somehow I think I've lost something here. No, I didn't. So, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even a death on the cross. Appearance, form. Again, this is Shema, his outside appearance. Um, and this is the one that, as a man, does change. He changes from a child to a, a adolescent, a teen, and, and onward. Um, that that did change. So, loaded question. Did Jesus have to die? Yes. Yeah, he had to die. But what about Enoch? In Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. God can do whatever he wants. If he wants to take me, I won't die. <laughs> John? We never had a sacrifice that walked with God. Say that again. We never had a sacrifice that just walked with God. That's right. We've got to have a death. Right. Okay. Uh, Without the death, there is no uh, testament. There is no there is testament. <laughs> exactly. I saw no Dan, you had your hand up, but you took it. Okay. <laughs> huh? Anyone else? Ben. I mean, that scripture is uh, for us. It's too, that's our understanding of death, our understanding of the heart stops beating, the brain stops functioning, the body's not there. I mean, that's our understanding of death. God saved him. He died. So, what do we do next? We don't understand. So, we look at it and we say, yeah, God can do whatever he wants to, right? Did it with Elijah, 2 Kings uh, chapter 2, verse 11. Suddenly, a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated. Elijah and Elisha, and Elijah went up in the world, went into heaven. But we're back to the same problem that John's already alluded to. There's a plan out there for us. Um, <clears throat> did he physically have to die? From our perspective, maybe not, if we look at these two scriptures. But if we look at it from the context that God gives us in scripture of what his plan is for us, we couldn't be saved without it. 
talking about about AIDS. He couldn't have accomplished his plan. He had to die to accomplish the plan. I mean, okay. Did he strictly <clears throat> have to die? Well, no, but he was going to because that was the plan. So again, you get to see the magnitude of the separation between where God, where Jesus was, and where he came to. Marianne? Um, God set up the system for us to look at, for them to look, us to learn from, of the sacrifice and the blood, and the blood sacrifice. And we needed Jesus' blood, and the only way is for him to die. So and for his blood to God. We, we needed, he knew what he was doing and what he was going to do and how he had to die. Okay. Kelly? I was going to say, we do see a connection between this and Noah because, because of Noah's faithfulness, he was living the way God wanted everyone to live. And he cleaned the entire earth with the blood, but spared Noah. And so in 1 Peter 3, we get the connection between Christ going to the cross, dying, and us being baptized into the water for the salvation connection. So there is one that goes back to Noah for that. Okay. Other thoughts? Run. If, if Jesus did not die on the cross, he would not be Jesus. We know that because it was prophesied. Mm -hmm. The Son of God died for us. So if that didn't happen, he's not Jesus. That it he's might be fulfilled. Yeah. John? This connects with uh, Dan's last comment. Did you ever play the game Clue? Lots of possibilities <clears> for the ending. <throat> but the author of this book had one very clear objective. He had son from the beginning was intended to die. You can't come up with an optional ending. Try. Mm -hmm. right. there, okay. there is uh, many of us, maybe, maybe when the Lord returns, those of us who have been walking with the Lord the way Enoch was, we won't die. We transform in twinkling in an eye. I was going to say, when, you know, we hear that when Christ came to earth, he turned the world upside down. And when you look at everybody else working their way towards being king, being president, being, you know, some believe they're gods on this ladder. And then you hear you have Jesus kind of saying, excuse me, I'm going back the other direction uh, to the point where his, his accomplishment was death. I mean, he's going completely backwards, bond service, everything, ending in death. It, it's completely backward from what all of, what many of us try to do, we're trying to climb that corporate ladder. We're trying to, you know, we're, we're working our way up, and that's completely counter to what Christ came to do. That's pretty good. I think you must have read the commentary because one of the one of the things <laughs> one of the things this guy pointed out was that, you know, man has a tendency to to want to ascend. That is our that is our motivation in life. We want to be higher up the, the corporate ladder. But Jesus's life is a continual descent. If you watch, I mean, from a, from a human point of view, his life descends from one position, you know, as a child, he's an innocent adult all along, all through, but the way he's treated is worse and worse until he is ultimately crucified. And then he has achieved the goal that God had in mind. Other thoughts? Yes, Josh. I think it's interesting, you know, one of those comments, when you look at the, the context of this, these first 11 verses of the, the chapter, you know, it starts off with, with Paul pleading with him to have the same mind, to have one mind, you know, this one goal of Christ. And for, for them to do that, he uses the example of how Christ did that, how he was humble. And then goes through this whole process of how he was humbled by becoming a man, by emptying himself. But for us to do that, and I think Ron said earlier, you know, we have to also, in our verse 8, he says, he tells you before, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. For us to humble, to have one mind, to have all this, we're going to have to be obedient. 
And I think it's just interesting that it goes through this whole deal of him, you know, lowering himself further and further, but then finishes this, this first section with, with 9 and 10 by, by his, but God's going to exalt him above all other names. And when we look at him, that's what we're going to bow to. And it all, it all points to this for, for a reason, because the Philippian church was doing things well, but they had some issues. They had some issues with each yep. other. And this is how they fixed them. Okay. Ron, did you have a... Well, I was, I was just going to say that kind of going along with the... We were talking about prophesying from the very beginning, the plan of God, and there are those who teach or, or have the view that this was an afterthought. This was God's plan B, right? Because, but it's just not that way. It, like John said from the very beginning, before the foundation of the world, we see that what God's plan was, because God's all knowing. So this was His plan. Right. Okay. I think I might have one more thing on here. John ten seventeen and eighteen. Therefore, my Father loves me because somebody took my life away from me. No. My Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. He, I mean, is, is there any doubt about what he's doing here? <clears throat> but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. So, um, the pretty, pretty powerful set of scriptures right here. Uh, uh, second, uh, Philippians 2, 1 through t uh, 11. Um, and I think that's it for today. Maybe. No, not quite. I still got more. <laughs> we, can, we can keep going. Um, and being found in appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. He was not, he was obedient not only in death, but to the worst possible kind of death. And do you think he didn't know about that? Deuteronomy chapter 21, he was familiar with the scripture. Uh, as a man, and, and I, I keep emphasizing that because there is a contrast between Jesus as God and there is Jesus as a man. In Deuteronomy 21, 22, uh, 23, it says, if a man has committed a sin deserving a death, he is to be put to death. And you hang him on a tree, and his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land with the, which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged, who was hanged on a on a cross, Jesus was, he is accursed of God. You think he didn't know that? I was going to say, this is why he died so quickly. He went willing. This was his purpose. Most people, in the examples like we see the two thieves, <coughs> struggle to stay alive, that somehow they're going to overcome this and they're going to survive because people's primary instinct is to survive in any situation. But because he did this, he willingly gave his life, he died quicker than normal. So the transition from God to man ends in this despicable act. Uh, it's re reiterated in Galatians 3.13 where it said, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being having become a curse for us. For it is written, curses is everyone who hangs on a tree. He knew about it, and he was a man, and yet he went through with it. Pretty amazing stuff. Thank you. Comments?